Hi, you'll have to bear with me as I seem to have a cold today, but this is an important video to get done and so I wanted to get it done. We're going to be looking at problem 2.2.7s, an old actuarial exam problem from the Mathematics of Investment and Credit, the sixth edition by Samuel Broberman. You can see it's a real long description here. Don't let that scare you off. It's, it's important and I especially want to emphasize something new the use of a BA2+, plus, the financial functions in the BA2+, plus, to helping us solve for an unknown interest rate. And if you were going to try to do it any other way, you'd have to do it with guessing and testing. So we're going to go beyond ordinary calculator usage. To find an unknown nominal annual interest rate charged on a loan, when the proceeds, the payments from the loan, are reinvested and a particular yield rate is obtained, this yield rate is described with a different compounding rate than the payments themselves. The payments are monthly. The yield rate is going to be described semi-annually. And that's what makes it a problem from section 2.2 of Broberman's book. Part of it, at least. Here's the, the problem statement. So Sally is doing the investing. She's giving, lending, 10000 to Tim. She's going to get a return on the investment. Tim is going to pay her back with interest. And she's even going to, to invest Tim's payments as well. He agrees to pay back the loan over five years with monthly payments at the end of each month. So this is going to be an annuity immediate. Sally can reinvest the payments from Tim into a savings account that pays interest at 6% compounded monthly. Now, this doesn't say it's an annual interest rate, but because they say compounded monthly, that would be the going assumption. 6% is a nominal annual interest rate. We're compounding it monthly. The yield rate on Sally's investment over the five-year period can be described as earning 7.45% interest compounded semi-annually. So Sally's investing 10000 That money, based on Tim's paybacks and her investment into this savings account, is going to grow, and the yield rate can be described this way. The goal is to find the nominal rate of interest compounded monthly, so that would again be an annual rate of interest, that's the assumption here because it says it's compounded monthly. Did Sally charge Tim on the loan? All right, so let's get our bearings as we often do with a number line. She's making the loan to Tim at time zero. And these times one, two, three, etc., are not going to be years. These are going to be months. Five years is 60 months. So we stop at time 60. Tim is making payments, unknown payments, let's call them X, at times 1, 2, 3, etc., up to times 60. Based on whatever uh, interest rate Sally is charging Tim, we can say the present value of this loan at time 0 is, well, first of all, it's Sally's 10000 investment, but it's also X times A60J, where J would be the effective monthly interest rate, it's not going to be the final answer to the problem. 12 times J would be the answer to the problem. 12 times J will be the nominal rate of interest. Okay, again, this symbol A is the present value of an annuity immediate. What about the future value of this annuity immediate? Right after, immediately after the last payment at time 60, <clears throat> excuse me, um, well, one way to describe that is with the symbols x times s, 60. Careful, though, this is going to grow to that amount based on Sally's investment into the savings account that's paying 6% interest compounded monthly. So the interest rate is not j here. It's not the interest, the monthly interest she's charging Tim. Instead, it's 6% divided by 12. It's half of a percent, or 0 0.005. That also has to equal her investment, 10,000, the initial investment up there, times an appropriate growth factor, based on this description, that her yield rate is 7.45% compounded semi-annually. The growth factor is going to be 1 plus 0 0.0745 divided by 2 to the 10th power. The 7.45% is an interest rate that's described as being compounded semi-annually, so we divide it by 2. 
We raise it to the 10th power because there are 10 half-year periods in five years. Every six months, this half a year, there are 10 of those periods. We need to raise that to the 10th power. These two things need to be equal. All right, let's figure out what this is. We could also figure out what that is, which will allow us to solve for x. Then we can plug that back into here and hopefully solve this for j. And then once we have j, we can multiply it by 12 to get the final answer. I'm going to use the calculator now to here to uh, evaluate these things. And this is going to be ordinary calculator usage, what we've done all along here. It's not going to be using specific financial functions yet. That's going to come in when we solve for j. So we have 0 0.0745 divided by 2. Add 1 to that. Raise it to the 10th power. And then multiply that by 10,000. It's probably OK to just write 14415.66 here, but I always am extra paranoid about decimal places. So I typically make a habit of writing them all. I could also store this, say, in register 0 if I want to. Might as well. And then we can evaluate this thing. It's going to be 1.005 to the 60th power minus 1 divided by 0 0.005. 1.005 to the 60th power minus 1 divide by 0 0.005. This thing is 69.7700 If I take the reciprocal of that and multiply by what this number, which is stored in register 0, I will get the value of x. So take the reciprocal, multiply what's in register 0. x is about 206.62. I'll write all the decimals, 206.61667482. I don't need that anymore. I think I will store this thing in register 0 now. Um, go ahead and do that, store 0. Now I come back up here. Now I could divide both sides by x and therefore solve for this present value and ultimately hopefully solve for j. But I also now want to take the time to show you the financial functions. And I think I will go ahead and leave the equation like this in showing you these financial functions. Though the value of x is important and again is in register 0. All right, before we use the, the financial functions, I typically make a habit of making sure that I've set my p slash y value and c slash y value to 1. What is p slash y and c slash y? And they are set to 1. Notice I can get there by pressing the second uh, function and then this button p slash y is 1, and then if I arrow down, c slash y is 1. What do those represent? p slash y means payments per year. c slash y means compounding periods per year. But here's the here's a tricky thing. I'm going to think of everything monthly here. I'm going to think of these as payments per month and compounding periods per month, even though it says y, OK? That's OK. I can think that way if I want. And that's sort of the default way that I think about it. I'm going to think of these things as representing payments per month and compounding periods per month. So, and j is, a, is an interest, effective interest rate per month. And that's what I'm going to solve for first. Let's exit out of, out of there now. Let's go ahead and enter this 10,000 as the present value in this equation. So I'm going to now press the PV key right there. That's going to now be stored in the calculator as the current present value. It's stored in a variable, if you like, called PV. Um, the value of x can be stored in the PMT. However, you're going to need to put a negative sign in front of it. And that seems a little mysterious, I know. 
to tell you the truth, I'm not sure why they program it this way. I'm, I'm guessing it might be because of some accounting rules that you were thinking of this is money going out from your checking account to your savings account here for Sally. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, but you want to enter it as a negative number. So I'm going to recall what's in register 0, which is the value of x. And I'm going to now put a negative sign in front of it. And I'm going to press the PMT button. Make sure it gets pressed and make sure you see the PMT. Okay. There are 60 payments. I want to make sure the 60 is stored in the value of n. 60, press n. That is now stored in n. Now I can solve for the unknown effective monthly interest rate, j. How? Press the CPT button, which stands for compute. Compute. I slash Y means interest rate per year, but we are thinking of it as an interest rate per month. Press that. It's computing. There's the answer, though that is as a percent. 0.733337666%. So to make it usable, I want to divide it by 100. There is J. J is 0 0.0073337. Therefore, the final answer is 12 times that. You might label the final, final answer I12, nominal annual interest rate compounded 12 times per year. I multiply that by 12, and I get about 0 0.088, about 8.8%. Is it right? We can check it. We can use the formula for A here in terms of J as 1 minus, well, it's, you know, it's V to the N, which in terms of J is going to be 1 over 1 plus J to the N, which N is 60 here. Divide by J. J again is this amount. Let's check that when we find that and multiply it by X that we get 10,000, okay? So looking right here, uh, let me go ahead, ahead and add one to this. I'm looking up here, raise it to the 60th power now. Take the reciprocal of that, subtract it from one, I'll press the negative button, plus one, and divide by J, divide by 0 0.00733377. The value of A is 48.39876, if I've done this right. Now multiply that times X, right there, and we should get 10,000. Times 206.6167482. Close enough to 10,000 to feel confident that I'm right, okay? So again, the answer to the problem is 8.8%.